Well, if you have your Bibles, open up to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. It says, to the chief musician set to do not destroy, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul into the cave. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up, Selah. My God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me into the midst of it. They themselves have fallen. Selah. My heart is steadfast. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. And Father, we thank you for your glorious word. Lord, I thank you that every time we open your word, you're here to meet with us. We pray, God, would you give us understanding this morning? Lord, would you give us ears to hear? eyes to see, a heart ready to receive, Lord, the the treasure that you want to impart to us. Lord, we want to be doers of your word. We want to walk in your word. So Lord, give us fresh application this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalm begins, to the chief musician, set to do not destroy, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul into the cave. Now, This was a a song that David wrote that was to be given to the chief musician in order that the nation might collectively worship the Lord in song with this. With a title like Do Not Destroy, I think it might have been the very first ever Hebrew heavy metal song written. But regardless, this was a song that was written before David ever became king. In fact, it was at a time of great persecution when David was writing this. King Saul was determined to kill David. And you know, there's some debate on which cave is mentioned here. Some point to the cave of Adullam, while others will say, no, it was the cave of En Gedi. And and I I, I tend to kind of believe the latter, and we're going to explore both of those We're going to see in the last five verses of the psalm why I kind of lean toward the caves of of En Gedi. But as the psalm opens up, David begins really with this threefold prayer. He he says, Lord, would, would you hide me? Lord, would you hear me? And Lord, would you help me? Hide me, hear me, and help me. I mean, how often have you and I been in places in our life where we've uttered the same words to the God of heaven. Lord, you got to help me. Lord, you have to hear me. You have to help me. He goes on in verse one. He says, be merciful to me. Oh God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed. The fact that David repeats his cry for mercy tells us that he's had about all that he can take. He's in a difficult situation, but yet David, he knows where to go and who to turn to for refuge. He, he says he's, he's running to the shadow of 
God's wings, essentially. The, the imagery here is of this baby chick running to his mother for protection. And I, I think of what Jesus said on that day of his tearful entry, some call it the triumphal entry. He's coming down the Mount of Olives. He's approaching the Kidron Valley and the city of Jerusalem. And he just begins to burst into tears. And, and in, in the Greek, it's not just a little tear, but this is an ugly cry. Have you ever had an ugly cry where your, your body is shaking, there's tears and there's snot coming out of your nose? This is Jesus. He's, he's looking, his heart is breaking, and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. You know, here's, here's the heart of God wanting to just bring people under the protection of his wings. And yet, isn't it interesting that there are so many that are not willing. We don't want God's protection. I'll find a different way. Let me ask you a question this morning. And the question is this. Is your life hid in Jesus? Is your life hid in Christ. Because that's a great place to be, isn't it? You know that if that's where you are. If you're one who is walking in obedience to Jesus Christ, if you're in step with him and his commandments, you know that your life is hidden. You're abiding in Christ, that, that place of fruitfulness, that place of, of power and protection. And if you're there, don't ever step out of that. Don't ever step out of his protection. Stay connected to Jesus. Stay in step with him. Now the question is, is how long will David stay? He says that he's going to stay there until these calamities have passed. It's hard to imagine a world without trouble, a world without problems, a world without crime. Wouldn't that be nice? a world without atrocities, a world without corrupt government. Oh, that would be nice. Fair judges. But the Bible says that Jesus is coming back and he's about to take the earth and he's about to make everything right. He's about to take the crooked paths and set them straight. But right now, Satan has rule over the earth and Satan has made a mess of things. What are you trusting in right now? What is your soul trusting in? Who are you taking refuge in? Sadly, instead of running to Jesus first, we see so many people, they'll, they'll run to their doctor, they'll run to a psychologist, to their lawyer, some even run to spiritual leaders. Many are just trying to forget their problems by getting lost in technology. You see people getting lost in their phones wanting to forget the problems of the day. Some escape into drugs and alcohol. Some turn to sex or relationships. But David is wise. He cries out to the Lord. In verse two, he says, I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. There's some Beautiful imagery in here. First of all, look at who God is crying out to. In the Hebrew, God most high is Elohim Elyon, the uncreated God of the universe, the God most high. This is God the supreme ruler. This is the final authority. This is the one that David knows as his savior. He's going to the top. I'm gonna to cry out to the most high God. This word perform, this God who performs, the, the word in Hebrew for perform is gomer, and it means to complete or to bring to an end or to perfect. And in this context, it does our heart such good to remember that the Lord God most high, he is the one who can bring our threatening circumstances to an end. He alone. In fact, he can bring 
our, our, our troubles and our difficulties to a sudden end. If you think about the idea behind Romans 8.28, we read and we know that all things work together f- for good. Not, this is not a blanket promise, though. This is for those who are the called, according to his purposes, for those who love God. You know, it's, it's this, if, if, if you love the Lord, if you're walking in obedience, you know that your circumstances, in the end, God is going to do something. He's going to do something beautiful through the trials and through the various hardships that, that we encounter. And we see in verse 3, here's, here's David. He's saying, Lord, hear me. David cries and God hears. Look at verse 3. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up, Selah. That, that word Selah in the Hebrew means stop and meditate on what you've just heard. Meditate, think about. He shall send from heaven and save me. The one who is walking in step with God, the one who is connected to Jesus, even though you're going through difficulties and hardships, even though the enemy seeks to swallow us, God is there. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Here's David, he's crying out to God, would you save me from injury? David, he's been wrongly labeled as a traitor. King Saul has put a price on his head. David, he's being treated like a criminal. David, he's living every day in constant danger and in constant threat. But David, he's going to the place, he, he, he's going to place God between him and the circumstance. He's placing God between him and the dangers. God between him and the threats. And David, he, he lists some of those dangers he was facing in verse four. He says, my soul is among lions. That's, that's a scary place to be. Have you ever been close to a lion? I don't think I'd want to be there. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. When we go back to 1 Samuel, we discover really the history that's played out for David so far. If you remember, there was a time in David's life where things in Israel were so bad, so dangerous, He had to flee to his enemies. He flees to the Philistine city of Gath, the home of Goliath. Do you you remember the giant that David killed? He goes there. He goes to Gath, to the enemy. It's safer in the Philistine city of Gath. He, He thought his chances of living among the enemy were better odds than living in Israel at the moment. As you follow the life of David from there, he flees to the cave of Adullam. And it's there at the cave where his family and his brothers and so many outcasts began to gather. In fact, David's numbers go from one to 600 while he's staying at the cave of Adullam. And from there, we know as we look at the map, he, he moves his family over to Moab. If you look down kind of the southern corner there, we're a little bit ahead on our slides. But down the, the right-hand side of the Dead Sea there is Moab. This was a spot where David's relatives, if you remember Ruth, his father's grandmother, she was from Moab. So David had some family connections there. If you remember back, the prophet Gad had also warned David not to stay in the cave of Adullam. It, it wasn't safe there. As we follow David's life, we see a situation at a city called Kililah, He had saved the people there from the Philistines, only later to be betrayed by them. Next, we see the Ziphites betrayed David to Saul. And and this was especially discouraging for David because the Ziphites were part of David's own tribe. David's own tribe was now betraying him to the enemy. But we see that God raised up the Philistines in a moment to distract King Saul, giving David time to escape. And, and David, he goes down to the western shore of the, of the Dead Sea to a place called En Gedi. It's this desolate wilderness, and you can just see from the photo here, 
It's, it's dry. It's hot. This is, this is one of the lowest places on planet Earth, and it's so hot it just sucks the water out of you. It's a, it's, it's a very uncomfortable place to be. But there in that desolate wilderness, there is an oasis, this little spot, this canyon. It's called En Gedi. It's, it's the spring of the goats. And to this day, you can go there and you can see the ibex walking around and... Um, just, just a beautiful place. But can you imagine David finding rest and refreshment here and enjoying the shade and the, and, and the cool water? But sadly, that rest didn't last long. Someone found out David and his men were there and they go back and they tell Saul and Saul comes and Saul shows up with 300 of his men. Now, I've been to and getting it. There's, there's one way in and out of that canyon. And you can just picture Saul's men setting a perimeter. David knows he's trapped. There's no place to go except into the recesses of the cave. And so David and his men, they, they, they go, and no doubt they're feeling trapped. And I believe it's here that David, he's reciting all of the dangers that he's facing to the Lord. And, it, and it's good to, to bring our anxiety to the Lord. It's good to bring our circumstances to the Lord. Even though the Lord knows all things and sees all things, it's, the Lord loves it. When we as his children come to him with our problems, we can come to God. And David does that. And there's something unique that I believe happens at, in this time. As David is hiding in the shadows and in the darkness of the cave, he realizes that it's not the cave that is giving him shelter, but it's the Lord God most high. It's a God that is bigger than his problems. It's a God, his God, that is bigger than the enemy that is set against him. We see in verse five, he says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. You know, David, he's saying, God, would you show yourself big? David, he has faith that his present circumstances, as dangerous as they were, as deadly as they were, his present circumstances was nothing compared to the greatness and the bigness of his God that he worshiped. He says in verse six, oh, well, actually, before we get to verse six, I, I, I want you to think about your life. How often... Are you in a circumstance that just seems impossible? How, how often do you feel like David, just backed into a corner? And there's just no way out. He, he goes on to say in verse six, they have prepared a net for my steps. The enemy is trying to ensnare me. And, and let me just be honest, if you are a child of God, if you are born again, if you are a spirit-filled Jesus follower, there is an enemy that is watching you, studying you, seeking how to ensnare you. He says, they've prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. Selah. One of the things I love to pray is, Lord, let the enemy fall on their sword. I love it when the enemy is, is ensnared and confused in its own wickedness. And that's what David is praying here. He wants us to stop and think about that. Now we know, Bible students, what happened at En Gedi. There Saul had David trapped. He had the numbers, 3,000 men surrounding that canyon. No one is going to get in or out of it without King Saul knowing about it. There would be no escape for David. Yet, Saul would enter the same cave as David. What are, what are the chances of that happening? There's, there's many caves. When you look at that, I have a photo of the caves up there. There's many caves. Yet the Lord directs Saul into the exact, we don't know which cave it is, but whichever one David was in, that's the one Saul's going into. I can just imagine as the fire is dying down at night, as Saul's men were falling asleep. David is there crouching in the corner. David's men, they're whispering in his ear, this is your time, kill him. 
Let's end this. It was then David begins to just creep forward. A bloody warrior. His enemy's asleep. David takes the knife. He pulls it out. Do you know what happens? He cuts the corner of his robe. And the men escape. He, David could have killed Saul and just ended it all right there in that moment. But David, he would not harm the Lord's anointed. He cuts the robe and he takes a piece of it to later make a point to King Saul. I mean, can you imagine the panic and the confusion in the cave the next morning? Because all of a sudden, early in the morning, is David shouting up at the king and the men, hey, King Saul. (laughs) Saul rubbing sleep from his eyes. He looks out. There's David. He was probably shocked. And what is David holding in his hand? Saul doesn't even realize it's a piece of his own robe. In fact, you know, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 24. In verse 8, let's, let's, let's just read this account together. Starting in verse 8 of 1 Samuel 24. It says, David also arose and went out of the cave and called out to Saul saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord Yahweh delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. No, and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. And I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog, a flea? Therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me. And see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. (coughs) Excuse me. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I. For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul and Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. How awesome is this account? David outnumbered. How amazing is our God? David continues in Psalm 57 and verse 7. He says, my heart is steadfast. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. The word in the Hebrew for steadfast 
If we have the slide, it's, it's kun. And this word means prepared, established, ready, right, fixed, stable, confirmed. Saying, Lord, would you give me a stable heart? Would you establish my heart? Would you secure my heart? I, I don't want a, a wavering heart. I don't want a fearful heart. I, I think of what, we, what, what, what James says in his epistle, you know, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, I, I trust the Lord, but I'm looking at my circumstances and I'm just, I'm fearful. David is saying, Lord, my heart is ready, it's right, it's fixed, it's confirmed upon you. And I just pray, Lord, would you give me a stable heart, an established heart, a secure heart. That's what I need. I've discovered when my heart is fixed on God that there really is no room for doubt in my life. There's no place for depression when my heart is fixed. Those, those fears and anxieties that are so easily there to attack me, when my heart is is fixed upon the Lord. Those fears and anxieties, they fall away. And what I've discovered is that praise and worship come flooding in. I mean, who wants to trade fear and anxiety for praise and worship? I mean, come on, that's a good trade. Lord, would you take my fear? Lord, take my anxiety and hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, God is so good. Those times when we're just fixed on Jesus. He goes on in verse eight, and I, I, think this, I, think, I think that this was passionate. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I mean, the neighbors would get really annoyed with a guy like this because he's up early before the roosters, banging those cymbals, playing his guitar, worshiping the Lord. He says, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. I mean, here's David. He has every intention of waking up the morning with worship. Here's a guy running for his life, by the way. His problems aren't over with Saul. This is just one battle the Lord took care of. But even though he's running for his life, living in caves, he still makes worship a priority in his life. That convicts me. I think so often worship is something that we do when we feel like it. But for the Christian, worship needs to be the priority. This is why we were created. We were created to worship. And David, he has every intention of waking up the morning with his worship, much like the way the rooster woke me up this morning as I was laying in bed. David, he has every intention of singing out this evangelistic song. He he wants the nations to know. He's witnessing to the heathen nations that surround them. Everyone needs to know the true God. El Elyon, God most high. The only uncreated God of the cosmos. And you know, guys, when we experience the goodness of God, the salvation of God, it has a way of just overflowing onto others. He says in verse 10, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Just think of God's mercy upon David. What a merciful God. That mercy has overflowed in the way that David has acted with Saul. David could have killed Saul. Could have ended that problem He extended mercy. When we act like our Father in heaven, it brings him glory. You know, the the Lord wants us to be imitators of him. How many times in scripture do we hear God say, be holy because I'm holy. I want you to be like me. We have God in flesh. We have Jesus Christ, our example If we've seen him, we've seen the Father. That is the example to follow. And when we act like our Father in heaven, oh, it brings him so much glory. 
If there's a difficult person in your life, maybe you feel like there's someone chasing you down, hunting you down. Maybe there's someone who's been dealing very unfairly with you. Maybe there's someone who's been hurling spears at you like Saul did to David. I think it's good that we need to remember that that person just might be anointed by the Lord to work God's purposes in your life. To make you into the man or the woman that God desires you to be. You see, the Lord was teaching David so much about leadership. The Lord was teaching David so much about being a king. God was teaching him so much of what it was like to follow him through these difficult circumstances. And sometimes when we're in those places, we want to retaliate. We want to just punch someone in the face, as tempting as that might be. But when we're in that place of retaliation, we miss the point of what God is doing in our lives. The Lord knows what he's doing. And here's the thing. God will remove that Saul from your life at the right time, in his time. But in the meantime, any given person or situation in your life, understand it could be the very instrument that God is using to make you into the woman or the man that he's created you to be. We come to verse 11, and David again cries out, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Here's David, he's repeating himself again. Be exalted. Be high, be lifted up. You are the creator God of the universe. You are God most high. You're beyond the sun and the stars. You're higher than the heavens. And here's a God big enough to speak the cosmos into being. We serve a God that is so powerful. He speaks and things are created. And yet, he's so tender enough to care for one frightened man in a cave. He's tender enough to, to draw people into his arms just like a, a hen gathers her chicks. What an awesome God we serve. What an amazing king we follow. Steadfast hearts, fixed hearts, prepared hearts, they are so rare among Christians these days. As, as Christians, as, as people following Jesus, we know that we're supposed to forgive people. We, we know that we're supposed to extend mercy. But it's hard not to be bitter at times. Does anybody else struggle forgiving does anybody else have a hard time not keeping a record of wrongs? You know, there's some pain that we go through in our life where it's just every morning we're reminded of it. Lord, how, how do I not keep a grudge when I've been slandered? When I've been falsely accused? When I've been robbed? When I've been taken advantage of? Lord, what am I supposed to do with these feelings? Well, do you remember what Jesus said to do? He said, pray for your enemies. And I like some of the prayers of David. Lord, kick their teeth out. Do you guys know that? It's a great psalm. Lord, train my hands for war. And there's a time and place for those prayers. But in, in this context, Jesus is saying, pray for that person that's hurt you. Pray for him. And this comes down to obedience. Are we going to obey Jesus or ignore Jesus? Are we going to be in step with Jesus or are we going to re rebel against the Lord? Jesus asks us to do hard things. I'm so thankful we have the Holy Spirit to empower us to follow. We're to pray for our enemies. We're to ask the Lord, would you bless them? That's a hard pray prayer to pray at times. Lord, would you draw this person to you? Lord, would you begin to work in their life? Would you change them? Would you bring them into a right, a right relationship with you?
Would you save him? And you know, I've discovered something because there's been many times in my life where I've prayed these prayers for my enemies. And I've noticed God does something amazing. He begins to change me as I'm obedient to the Lord, as I'm praying these prayers that Jesus asked me to pray, my heart begins to change. My feelings change. My perspective changes. And because I'm I'm pouring treasure into my enemies through prayer, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the Lord begins to change my heart. And he sets me free from my bitterness and from my anger and my rage. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if if Jesus is not Lord of your life, I know there are a lot of people that that know about Jesus. There are There are people that have spent their whole lives in the church hearing about Jesus, reading the Bible, and they even believe in Jesus. But guess what the Bible says? The Bible says that the demons also believe and they tremble. So believing in Jesus, what does that mean? What's important is that you bow and make him Lord of your life, that you surrender your will to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's important that you ask Jesus, would you forgive me? of my sin, and guys, we've all sinned. Ladies, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We've all missed the mark of God's perfection. But when we ask the Lord to forgive us and to cleanse us, he's faithful and just to do just that, isn't he? He's faithful to to fill us with his Holy Spirit. He is merciful. And listen, he wants to shelter you for all eternity. How glorious is that? He'll save you from your sins. He'll establish your heart. And for those of you who are born again, for those of you who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what an encouragement for us to just set our hearts on him and to come back. Guys, this is like an everyday thing. It's it's not a one-time deal. Every morning his mercies are new, but every morning we got choices to make. Am I gonna yield to the king today? Or am I going to go my own way? Lord, I, I want to set my heart on you. I want to fix my eyes on Jesus. Lord, I want to run to you and find shelter in you. And you know what I've discovered? As we set our eyes on Jesus, mercy really truly does become second nature. It's, it's not a natural thing, but the Lord does it. Our hearts are established. They're stable, secure, secure we are able to endure hardship like a good soldier because we have securely determined to shelter in our God. Fear has no hold as we walk by faith. We're fixed, we're steadfast, we're enjoying the presence of our God. Even if the Lord chooses to prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies, What a good God we serve. What an amazing king Jesus is. That's a king, he's a king that I want to follow in the battle. Amen? Father, would you give us steadfast hearts? I thank you for your mercy, Lord. Your mercy that is new every morning. Thank you, Lord, that our souls can Come to you, Lord. You you invite us to come boldly before your throne of grace to find help in time of need. Thank you for the refuge we find in you, Lord. Lord, we we long for you to come back. This world is losing its ever-loving mind. It's insane what's what's taking place among the nations right now, but we know that you're gonna come again and we cry out, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Continue, Lord, to send help Pour out your mercy, your truth, Lord. Our... Be exalted, Father. Let your glory be above all the earth, Lord. Lord, may we be people that wake the dawn with worship. Father, may we be people that take the message, the good news, your glory to the ends of the earth, Father. Father.
We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.